And ladies and gentlemen, if I can ask you to take your seats, please. We're going to get started. Try and get started on time because we know there's another session coming in right after this. And for those of you in the back, if you, if you wish, there's plenty of room up front. Make it a little more intimate if you want to come forward. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. My name is James Fon. I'm the executive director of Internews' Earth Journalism Network. And we're very pleased this morning to have a session on climate change, what lies ahead. Um, some of you may have joined us yesterday. We had a previous panel on climate change. So that was very interesting. And uh, so it's, it's great to be able to follow up with uh, another panel. And this time, we're going to look a little deeper into some of the issues. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us this morning, first of all, Martha Mendoza from the Associated Press. She's going to be speaking on the California wildfires. Uh, she'll be followed by Fabian Mazzonave from Folia de Sao Paulo, uh, who will speak about his work covering the Brazilian Amazon and, of course, the fires that have been happening there recently. And, and then we'll have Laurent Richard, who is the director of Forbidden Stories, and he'll be speaking on threats to journalists and, and threats to journalism safety and what, what can we do about that. So it should be a great morning and of course then we'll open it up the floor to all of you and we we'll look forward to your questions and a lively discussion. So I think without further ado I'll turn it over to Martha to come on up and please thank you. Hi. Um, how many of you live in places where you're already having wildfires? Show of hands. How many of you do not have wildfires where you live right now? Okay. So for those of you who don't, I think you might anticipate that you will be. Um, this has become a major problem for us in Western United States. And it used to be an occasional issue, and it has become a catastrophic issue. Um, and so what I want to talk to you about is covering wildfire before, during, and after what we can do as investigative reporters so that you're not just telling the same story of how many acres just burned last night. Um, personally, I love forests. I love the way they smell. I spend a lot of time in the woods. We are fortunate to have California redwoods where I live. Um, almost daily I am in the forest because it's that special to me. Um, they also play a critical role in our, country, in our planet, right? And deforestation results in 15% of the world's carbon emissions. And so if you live in a place where you are experiencing deforestation, that unto itself is a serious climate story that needs to be addressed. Um, if you're in a timber producing country, think about what that's doing for our planet and think about reporting it. Thousands of wildfires, large and small, are underway at any given time across the globe. We all have our seasons of wildfires. Beyond the immediate health effects, this biomass burning is part of the equation for global warming. In northern latitudes, wildfires actually are a symptom of Earth's warning. Um, one biomass burning expert at NASA told me, we already see the initial signs of climate change and fires are a part of it. So this was, you can see, this was about July. You can see where there's <laughs> wildfires going. My state of California in 2018, we had more than 8,500 wildfires. We burned 766,000 hectares. 15 years ago, our wildfire situation looked a lot like Europe. Like, wow, we're having some big wildfires. But in California, since, those, since that period, it has become um, as I said, at times catastrophic. Um, and in the 15 years from when it was, wow, we're having some wildfires to catastrophic, we've had no significant forestry management plan changes. Our firefighting and evacuation programs are out of date and underfunded. Um, we are in what we call an era of mega fires. They erupt so quickly and they burn so hot and they move so fast. Um, I covered a few mega fires in 2018. Typically, a wildfire is going to be moving through a forest at about um, 10 kilometers per hour. If you think about running, how hard that would be to outrun. But these mega fires go about 
two or three times as fast. Um, this is the town of Paradise, which was once a lovely town in our Sierra Nevada. It, there's a sweet legend about this town, and I spent summers here as a teenager. Um, they said on a blazing hot day in the 1850s, a lumber mill crew was wandering through this area and lay down under some trees to cool off, and the boss said, boys, this is paradise, and then they established a community there and named it that. Um, when President Trump came to see the burnout, he called it something else, but we kept reminding him that the real name of this town was Paradise. Um, I don't know if you recall that. Okay, climate change and wildfires. It's pretty simple, but when you're writing your story, when you're covering a wildfire, just like when I use a Freedom of Information Act request to get documents, I mention it in the story so that my readers or viewers will understand why it's important to have public information. The same thing is important now to be writing if you're covering a wildfire or a potential for a wildfire in your community. It's important to mention that this is associated scientifically, without a doubt, with climate change. So stronger winds from bigger storms mean more fallen branches for the wildfires to consume. There's increased extreme wet weather, which we en enjoyed this summer in California, so that just primes forests for fire by growing more fuel. And then we have more hot days compared to cold, and that means drier, hotter, fiercer fires. And we have longer droughts and warmer spring times, and so that means smaller snowpacks and a drier forest fuel. These are just a few of the elements. If you talk to a climate scientist, they'll walk you through why we're gonna have more wildfires. I wanna talk to you about um, before, during, and after the fire, what we should do as investigative reporters, not hot shots with cameras, but people who want to dig a little deeper into this. Before a wildfire, and if you live in a, one of those places where you raise your hands where you don't have any, but if your forests are getting drier, think about sourcing up. There's fire scientists. What is their research and modeling? Climate scientists, what are their predictions? Public health experts, what are they looking at for smoke exposure? And even if your country doesn't have them, if a neighboring country is having them or even somewhere on another part of the earth is having them, you might wanna know what that smoke exposure is doing in your own community. Economists, is there any forest management going on? Europe's forests are deeply managed um, and maybe more for the profit motive than for the um, wildfire management. And then community advocates, are, are, is anyone thinking about evacuations? Is anyone looking at their landscaping? Let's, let's talk a little more about that. There's data stories to be done identifying communities with the highest cumulative risk of wildfire um, based on the probability of what homes are gonna burn. I speak to this with vast experience. I'm telling you, I have been in so many forests with homes in them and I see the homes burning up. And I will admit that I am a bit of a um, I somewhat get ex excited seeing all these forests burn up, but it's crazy when you see people's homes burn up, and it's um, horrible when, when people return to their homes and realize everything's lost. In the U.S., despite warnings, people are building more homes in wildfire-prone areas, um, and they're also rebuilding in these areas. As many as 1.2 million new homes will be constructed in the highest wildfire-risk areas of California in the coming years. So people build homes in the forests which are bound to burn. Um, there are new building codes um, which California has adopted and key to this is fireproof roofs. In Paradise, that town that I showed you that the whole town burned out, um, there was now and then a roof or two or a house or two that wasn't burned and it was because they had fireproof roofs, prior, fireproof decks, near home landscaping and fireproof exterior walls. So it, you might check your building codes and see what you got. There's also this whole idea of um, having a buffer zone between your building and the property. And when the firefighters are deciding which house they're gonna save, they pick the houses where they've put in the hard work on the buffers. Um, so now I wanna talk about what to do during the fire. This was, we have, we call them fire nados now. Um, this was one last year. People were evacuating, like they say, hey, there's a fire coming, you should get out of your neighborhood. People have a little bit of time. And so they're packing up their cars and all of a sudden, this was near Reading, the sky turned black 
while they were packing up their cars, and there was a huge wind that came through, and then, like, like a huge wind, and then fire just landed on them. Um, so when I went into this neighborhood after the fire, there was trees that had been taken up and had landed inside of homes, and there was, um, and even the home had not burned up, but the it was just you know seriously damaged by the tree coming in, and this is because it's so hot that we have these fire natos now. So the temperatures during this fire outside were about, I don't know Celsius, about 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then you have this huge fire going on top of that. So during a fire, number one, stay out of the way of the firefighters. Number two, don't endanger residents and their property. And then you can report the news. So I don't know how much access you have, but in California, journalists are allowed wherever we want to go during emergencies. We can go behind police lines, unless there's an active shooter, although actually sometimes they don't pay attention to us at that point. We can go into evacuated zones. We can drive right up to the fire crews. We go through training and we learn, <laughs> when they give us these backpacks, and we learn how to um, lie down when the fire comes right at us and put the put the um, blanket over ourselves and then let the fire pass over us. Um, and, and we're required to wear protective clothing during the fire, so we're all, all the reporters are marching around looking. I don't know if you are familiar with Bob the Builder. Um, <laughs> but we have these yellow suits we wear with the helmets and boots, and it's no joke. Like, if you're not in your boots, you're going to burn your feet because we're marching around on the embers. Um, one of my children borrowed my fire suit to be a Chilean miner during that crisis, so it's one of those outfits. Um, anyways, you have to stay out of people's way, but during the fire, it's during the fire, look at who's being evacuated and how. So getting people out of hospitals and nursing homes is a key question during a wildfire. How are they getting them out? During this um, recent fires in Paradise, they got everyone out of the hospital, and then they brought them back into the hospital because they couldn't get out the roads because the roads were blocked. And then the fire was coming to the hospital, and so the hospital staff actually just started throwing hospital patients into their cars. I talked to a nurse who had taken a woman from a stretcher, picked her up, put her in the back of a pickup truck, and then lay down in the back of the pickup truck next to her and pulled the blanket over both of them and drove out through the fire. So the first people I look at during when the fire is going is who's being evacuated, the people. And then, uh, maybe this says something about me, but I look at the animals. And um, in California, often we're allowed into a community that has been evacuated um, days and even weeks before the um, homeowners are allowed in. And a terrible mistake I make is being at an evacuation center and people will say, oh, can you look at my home? And then I go look and their home's not there and I realize I'm not the person who should be telling this person their home is gone. But what I do do is pick up a lot of cats. I don't, I don't know what happens to the dogs in the fire, but the cats seem to come crawling out after, like it's, it, it's still smoking, but there's cats around and I'll throw them in the back of my car and take them to the shelter. Um, they smell horrible, but they're, they seem to want to uh, get out of there. And that's, but I, I do, so I start with how are the people being evacuated and how are the animals? And this was in Malibu where equestrian um, rescues just brought them to the beach. The next thing that happens quite quickly in my area <laughs> is looting begins. So an area is completely evacuated. Everybody has to be out, except some people have stayed behind with their homes and a hose and saved their homes. And other people know all the back roads into a community. And so you have some homes that have not burned down. Maybe they had fireproof roofs and looting begins. Um, it was a very not told story that after the Paradise Fire, the sheriff shot somebody within days of that fire who was out there looting. Um, it's, it's a big temptation for would-be thieves. Uh, I use, during the fire, I use um, flight data. Is everybody aware of how to track planes in this room? I see a lot of heads nodding. So we track the planes to see where they're dumping water. Um, and I've seen drops on, you can see like who are they dropping? Are they dropping on the mayor's house? Are they dropping on the fire chief's house? Um, we also use satellite mapping to cover the breaking news to see the size of the fire and trace where they're burning. Um, EU has Copernicus page. NASA also provides these, and Digital Glo Globe is super helpful for anywhere in the world. 
to get satellite images during a fire. Um, is everybody familiar with Digital Globe's newsroom? Okay, Digital Globe is a company that takes, tries to take a picture of everywhere on planet Earth every day. And they are friendly to reporters and they're private companies. So they would sell their images to defense departments and such, but during a major fire, if you ask them, they could get you, for example, before and after satellite photos of a particular latitude and longitude. James, am I running out of time? Okay, I'm gonna stop here very quickly. We have twice daily press briefings in California. You might wanna take a look at them to ask your own fire departments for similar data. But then during the fire, the most critical thing is what started it. And for us, we look at our public utility companies daily reports where they can point to damage on transmission tires. This led us to the community of Polga, California for this latest one in paradise where they had had a spark on a high, high line transmission. Um, and you could see that this is what the, our, our utility, our electric company has now gone bankrupt over California's wildfires because they were not maintaining their lines. So if you have for profit electricity, that's something to look for as well. Are they making money selling electricity to people and not maintaining their lines? And um, should I, am I out of time? I can stop now. Oh, two, if I have two more minutes, I'll. One more minute. One more minute, okay. Post fire is when it gets exciting because you can start doing your public records requests, right? Investigate what are the economic and social costs, what medical issues are arising, what's happening to the victims, um, what are the toxic hazards going on. I'm gonna tell you about this photo and then I'm gonna stop. I was working with a photographer who I often am at fires with and um, he's been telling me to start taking more and more photos and I said, I think that you should, we should get really close to these guys and you should be shooting much closer to them. And he said, you know, you're, you're telling me how to shoot the photo and so he shot it from far off and this was like the page one New York Times Washington Post photos that day, so. Um, so post-fire, the, the, the cleanup and the toxicity is, as you can see, just a huge story to look into. So on that note, I will stop, but feel free to ask me questions later. Thank you. Yeah. Fabiana? Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, um, first of all, I would like to thank Mal Foundation for inviting me for, to participate in this conference. Uh, I, I live in Manaus, which is the largest city in the Amazon. And so during most of the year, I'm far from the newsroom and from other colleagues, so it's always reconforting to reunite with my tribe from time to time and in order to reflect what, what, what the hell we are doing there. So. And for me, it's uh, an honor to speak in, in the city of Hamburg, which is, uh, as you probably, most of you know, it's the, the, the city of Kaufmann Osiecki, I think I pronounced it right, and uh, one of the greatest journalists of all times for me. And if, for those who are not familiar with him, doing the Vi Weimar Republic, which bears a lot of uh, similarities to the world we live in, uh, he, he broke a story about uh, how Germany was rearming the uh, uh, its army, and he was tried, and he was tried, and he was condemned, and he spent some some months in jail. When Hitler rose to power, he was in jail again, and when he was there, he won the Nobel, Pri Nobel Prize for Peace, and and he was never able to 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 gather the, the prize, and he died in prison. So uh, he's he's truly a. a, a it's really uh, inspiring for all of us. So uh, I will start talking about the Amazon. It's mostly about people because in the Amazon, the fires are provoked by people, most of them. Uh, and so I will start with this picture. So it's, uh, all, all the pictures that, that have no name of the photographers are my pictures. Uh, the, the last one was a picture that I took too. Uh, so this one I took, uh, just uh, my, my last assignment. Um, 
can 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 anybody guess what this is about? So, so this is this is not pro this is not a protest for the climate week. This is uh, these are benches. Uh, this is a fallen, representing a fallen tree. This fallen tree is made of concrete. So the mayor of the city thought it was a good idea to to put a bench like this in the middle of the city. Uh, the city is called New World, and it's uh, it's in the part of the Amazon that's. Uh, being already uh, deforested, uh, this this part of the of the Amazon was deforested in the, in the 70s, uh, when the European descended uh, colonizers from the south uh, took over this part. Uh, this is the state of Mato Grosso. So uh, this happened in the 70s, and in 1973, there was this tribe. Uh, this is the Panara uh, tribe. Uh, so Kriti, he's still alive, uh, although one third of uh, his uh, ethnic group died in the first two years of the contact. And this was just before, this is yesterday, this is 1973. So this is by the bank of the main river there. It's called the Peixoto de Azevedo River. So this is how the, the river looks like today. This is exactly the same part of the river. Uh, this is, uh, Mostly, uh, the first station is mostly provoked by illegal gold mining, but it, you can also see soybean in the back, and the city and, and the region also has cattle. So, in Novo Mundo, New World, and several other cities from the Amazon, they all uh, voted for Jair Bolsonaro by landslide. Okay, and the message. Uh, that Bolsonaro gave to these regions was very clear. Uh, the indigenous people's rights and environmental laws passed in the past decades were the culprits, are the culprits for the economic and development. And Bolsonaro will do whatever it takes to uh, make Brazil great again. So he promised, and he's keeping this promise, that the indigenous lands will be open to mining and agriculture and that he resume and finish projects uh, that uh, the military dictatorship in the 60s and 70s couldn't accomplish. One of them is to build a highway across uh, Calha Norte, which is the world's largest uh, protected area. Um, so this picture, um, uh, this is um, the tallest, tallest guy there is the Minister of Environment. So this is in February, and it was his first visit in the Amazon in his lifetime. The first visit in his life. He's 43 years old. And he chose an illegal agriculture uh, plantation inside the indigenous territory. This area is under embargo, officially. And he couldn't care less, and he went there. So th that's, that's the kind of government we we're having right now about uh, uh, regarding the Amazon. So his first trip was to an illegal plantation in an embargo area. So uh, throughout his political career, career, Bolsonaro has expressed racist views against indigenous people. In a speech in Congress, he famously said that, and I quote, it's a shame that the Brazilian cavalry hasn't been as efficient as the Americans who exterminated the Indians. Three days ago, in his speech in the UN General Assembly, he attacked the Haoni, one of the worst, most important indigenous leaders, in a moment that Haoni's land in Kayapo has been invaded by hundreds and hundreds of illegal gold miners. Um, but the first station, of course, is far from being a new thing. Uh, since 1985, when the satellite-based um, uh, measure started, the Brazilian Amazon uh, lost 40. 47 million hectares of forest. That's an area as large as Germany, Denmark, Holland, Belgium combined. Along with, uh, along with them, countless of species were never described. What, what is new with uh, Bolsonaro is that the federal government is promoting deforestation. He doesn't even need to change the legislation. Uh, 
it's a, it's a region that is very lawless. And so his words are enough to empower gold miners, land grabbers, and other environmental criminal offenders. This disconstruction of uh, Brazil's environmental policies couldn't have happened in a worse moment. The Amazon, uh, the Amazon has already lost 20% of its coverage, pushing the forest to a tipping point from where it cannot recover. Scientists have warned that rainforests risk degrading into a savanna, after which its capacity to absorb carbon will be sharply diminished. The end of Amazon rainforest will have, of course, a, ma a major impact in, in climate change. Uh, transpiration from the tree leaves generates uh, the so-called flying rivers that flows to Brazil's heavily populated southwest, including Sao Paulo, which will most likely see much less rain to fill its reservoirs. So this, um, I'm sorry about the soul searching. <laughs> This is, the, this is the context where I live and where I work. Um, as I said in the beginning, it's a very solitary job. Uh, with the exception of this past few weeks where several colleagues from all over the world went, went to the Amazon, uh, I, I'm alone there. So uh, Folha is, is one of the four national newspapers in Brazil, and it's the only one that has a correspondent there. That's me. Uh, the other newspapers cover from Sao Paulo, Brasilia, and and that's as far as Hamburg <laughs> sometimes to, to reach this place. So uh, it's a mostly undercover region. Uh, and, and the Brazilian Amazon um, is 59% of the territory. If, it's, if, if, Brazil, if the Amazon was a country, it would be the sixth largest country in the world. So it's, it's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so as overwhelming and mostly depressing the, this task is, I have two things that facilitate my work. Uh, first, Brazil produces a lot of data. The problem is that we don't use it properly. So four, four days ago, when, when I was already here in Hamburg, I received a tip from a, that a military police uh, was caught in a raid against illegal logging, uh, and the source was that tipped me off was under threat, so I felt like I, I had to write the story, uh, even from here, so um, I published this story. Um, it says that uh, the, it was a raid by the military and they apprehended almost 1,000 uh, uh, trees in this uh, company that it's owned by this military police lieutenant officer. Um, it was published in the Brazil Ledger's newspaper and um, three days, after that, nothing happened. Nothing happened to him. He's still working. Uh, actually, I, I, I found in the, in the website that uh, the same company, the same owner, uh, had the same problem 10 years ago. Uh, they were fined, they never paid the fine, and they were still allowed to operate. So th this, I'm just saying that this is the contest uh, that, that I work, that crime, environmental crime is socially accepted and even promoted uh, by federal and state governments. Um, so th this, is, this is nothing new. Um, do, do you know what, what, the, what the name Brazil comes from? So, br uh, so, it's, it's almost, oh, so Brazil, Brazil is a timber. So uh, we, we, we're named after a timber that was uh, deforested by the Portuguese and this, and this uh, timber is, uh, is almost uh, extinct. So I know this is a hands-on um, operation, so I'll, I'll give some tips. This is from uh, Facebook. Uh, it's, a, it's a web page called the Mumber Lab. It has over 60,000 people, and they all portray pictures of uh, they're doing illegal logging all over the Amazon. They have their names. The only thing that they avoid is putting the plates of the trucks, but uh, it's, it's as open as you can imagine. You, you can buy hats called the legal lab and the internet and do and this thing. So th that's how social accepted is. I'll finish with uh, some tips. That's what this Congress is about. So um, that's only for the Amazon. So all deforestation ends in fire, but every, not every fire means deforestation. When you deforest a place, so you have to cut the trees before and let the, and let the, the forest dry and then you burn it. Because in, in the Amazon, uh, the fires are not, are not natural fires. They're always, always meant for both. So um, the second one is logging degrades, 
the graze the forest, but it's not deforestation. So when it, please don't <laughs> illustrate uh, deforestation stories with logging trucks. That it, it's, it's, it's not the same story. Uh, follow the road. All deforestations occur in, in close to road. Don't believe in Bolsonaro. If you read the news, <laughs> uh, he fired the, 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 the head of this institute, which is a government-owned institute, because they were publishing data, accurate data, so he fired him. Uh, but they're still producing data. I, we don't know for how long, but uh, it's the best website. Uh, and for, for my colleagues from the, uh, Latin South America, th there's also data from South America there, from uh, especially fires. Uh, don't cover the Amazon as just 20% of the forest is lost. It's like every part of the Amazon is unique. It's like you find species that only happen in this particular place. When you lose a part of the Amazon, you lose a whole ecosystem. It's, it's not 20, 25%. It's, it's something that is gone forever. Uh, this is for, uh, you usually hear that from other politicians from other countries in the Amazon that coca is a major deforestation drive. It's not. May, actually, it can be the, the opposite. When people change, because coca makes so much money that when, when people change coca uh, to other products such, such as corn, they have to increase the area and they have to deforest more. So co coca is, is a problem, but not an environmental problem. So don't, don't fall into this trap. Alvaro Uribe in Colombia, said that all the time we used to reproduce and other politicians say the same thing. Avayanas on the ground, it's me, don't, don't use boots, use Avayanas, and please cover on the ground. It's very hard to grasp what's happening in the Amazon if you're not there. Please try to make it, I'm here to help later if you, if you want. Uh, try each, each indigenous people in its own uh, uh, culture, it's, it's the, the variations is just as big as here in Europe. Each each people has its, its culture, its language, its tradition. Try to find people who actually live in the Amazon. Forest people are not uh, the foresters, and this is happening all over the world. That people say that Amazon is, is not the lung of the world. Amazon produces oxygen, but also consumes it, so it's roughly the same. There are many, many uh, reasons to preserve the Amazon, but oxygen is it's not one of them. Okay, thank you. So hi, my name is uh, Laurent Richard. I'm, I'm the, the director of Forbidden Stories. Uh, I'm not a climate change expert. Uh, I'm just uh, running that uh, a nonprofit called Forbidden Stories. Basically, our mission is to continue the work of uh, assassinated, jailed, or threatened reporters. And um, we are, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, there is many partners of Forbidden Stories during that conference here. So, and uh, this is a collaborative work. Uh, so we just started two years ago, and, and before explaining what the last project we were doing on the environment, I can just tell you a few words about who we are. So we start with the Daphne project. Maybe some, you, some of you have heard about it. We were continuing the work of um, uh, Daphne Carona Galizia, who was killed in Malta, uh, and we were working with 45 reporters, 18 news organizations, trying to complete the work of Daphne and to investigate the killing of Daphne, but also to continue the important work she was, uh, she was doing in, uh, in Europe. Um, we <coughs> the, the project I was talking about is um, the Green Boot Project. So we just published that project last June. Um, this is a, pro a collaborative project. We were partnering with uh, more than 40 reporters, 37 news organizations, uh, all over the world. And basically the idea was to continue the work of uh, reporters who were investigating environmental scandals all over the world. And when we, we start investigating those, um, this, uh, this project, we were um, 
reading some reports from other organizations like Reporter Without Borders, CPJ, who were identifying a lot of reporters who were killed because they were working on the same kind of stories, toxic waste, trafficking, illegal logging, um, uh, illegal mining, and we, can, and we can understand from the previous presentation that how those traffic can impact the climate change. So the main idea of Green Project was to investigate the killing, investigate the threats, and to continue the work. We are not doing any kind of advocacy, we are just um, journalists. And the DNA of Forbidden Stories is to consider that when a journalist gets killed for one story, that may be because the story is extremely important for the public opinion. So our goal is to continue and to think that the collaboration can bring protection. So that's uh, what we try to do. And uh, I want just to show you um, some videos about this project that, that will explain more precisely in a very short time what we, what we did with all those fantastic uh, partners. Uh, just need to Jagendra, he went after a particular minister and he started writing about his uh, involvement in the sand mafia. They have money. came here for a very important reason. It's about uh, finishing the work of um, assassinated or under threat reporters. How many men were involved in this raping? Sita, wakati mgini wa muata wa nane. Oh, export details. He told me again that we should be careful and don't tell anyone where you're staying. The importers are in more than 80 countries. We did a ranking, we looked at specific companies. I'm just a journalist. I'm sorry about that. I don't mean to be rude. Sorry about it. Stop it. La policía disparó o no contra los manifestantes. No se sabe oficialmente. So yeah, that was um, the Green Book Project. Um, sorry. Um, <coughs> the, the, um, the idea of uh, this project was to uh, so to show the public opinion that what is happening in Tanzania, what is happening in Guatemala for journalists who, who um, were investigating this gold mine in Tanzania or this uh, ferro-nickel mine in Guatemala is not only a Tanzanian story, it's not only uh, an Indian story, it's uh, a worldwide story. And it's um, um, the, the goal of that investigation, and th this is why collaboration is extremely useful, is that we were tracking the supply chain and we were willing to discover who is buying that gold from that mine that is not green at all in Tanzania. And that was extremely difficult to, to find information, but we find it. And, um, and we find out that, uh, for instance, Apple, Microsoft is buying the gold from that mine. And um, it was um, um, uh, extremely important to, to, um, to, um, to work that way and to make sure that um, uh, the, the story is not only, uh, and the issue of one reporter who have been killed somewhere far away from us is, is not only a violent attack against press freedom, that's something really concerning, a soul for uh, an important information that is missing for the public <coughs> opinion. And so we, 
we think that we do have to have um, that kind of global inspire to face that kind of global crimes. So what we, of course, um, uh, um, we, what we were facing and what they were facing first, like uh, Sandia, Ravi Shankar in India, is um, investi investigating on the environmental issue, is investigating about corruption, is investigating about powers, is invest investigating about big corporation. And, and most of the time when you have illegal logging, it's because also of the corruption of the environmental agency who cannot do his work because of that corruption level. And uh, so that's why I think collaboration is extremely interesting to, um, as a tool to, to, um, to investigate and to bring protection. So I would just want to show you another um, video. This is Sandhya Ravi Shankar. She's uh, an Indian journalist. She's based in uh, Chennai in Tamil Nadu, she is investigating the Sand Mafia. The Sand Mafia there is a powerful organized crime group that is um, taking the sand uh, illegally uh, um, with a lot of uh, uh, corruption uh, on the political level and on, on many levels. And she is uh, um, basically uh, investigating a lot of that and she's receiving a lot of threats. Initially it started slow. There were just press releases of, uh, from the miners and their associations stating that I had taken bribes from the rival miners. Um, my mobile number was put out on social media and then I got a whole heap of calls uh, from people uh, threatening to rape me. And then there were a couple of uh, defamation cases that are ongoing. Um, I don't think that's ever going to end. Uh, the miners have openly declared that they have five detective agencies following me everywhere I go. And my name is part of an official uh, report of the government of India, uh, stating that I'm somebody who has enmity with the miner and in a very slanderous manner. So, so the basic point that I'm trying to make is that this is a very difficult investigation. I'm the only person writing about this because it's a, you know, it's a bomb. So, yeah, last word about um, uh, the kind of uh, technique we were using um, during that investigation. We were using a lot of uh, open source intelligence uh, uh, techniques to investigate um, using satellite pictures to um, um, get some evidence of uh, the impact of the, the mine, doing some forensic analysis of uh, some fish that fishermen are fishing every day in the lake close to the um, mine in Guatemala, for instance. And that's, um, uh, we were so tracking planes that are transporting gold. Uh, we were um, doing basic uh, traditional journalism in sometimes door doorstepping some CEOs. We were confronting uh, some um, um, uh, press officer from a uh, giant uh, in the Silicon Valley who were telling us that uh, they are more green than ever, that they have a supplier's list, They're, they are very transparent. But when we look into the suppliers list of Apple, for instance, who is pretending a lot to be extremely green, we find out that uh, they were only communicating about the name of the raffinery, but not the mine, uh, not, not the mine. So we, we ask them to disclose the identity of the mine that is providing the gold to the raffinery because all the, all the environmental impact uh, are happening, of course, uh, around the mine or all the human rights violation were happening around the mine where people have been killed or raped by the guards of the mine. And so they were not able to provide that <laughs> information. And we finally find that uh, the list of the, all the customers and the clients of that raffinery in India where the gold was coming from Tanzania. And then we find out that more 500 um, big companies in the tech industry were buying that gold from that uh, raffinery. So, so it's, um, it's a so, um, a huge part of the investigation to uh, um, um, also to inform all the consumers uh, that are reading our story, and to uh, and to and so to to ask all the CEOs and the companies to to be much more transparent, especially when they are pretending to be uh, very green. So uh, this is it. I think that um, collaboration, but I'm sure that you are already all, all of you are very convinced of all of that is really. Um, an important tool, especially for environmental um, uh, stories, uh, not only to bring protection to the journalists who feel alone some, uh, a lot of the time, but also to provide a lot of information and to make the story very global and to reach a larger audience. Thank you.
Thanks very much to our speakers. Uh, so now we're going to throw it open to you. We have uh, microphones here, and we can also, I believe we can bring some microphones roving to you. If you have questions, please come step up to the microphone and state who, yes, we have. Do we have some? Do we have any roving? Hello, uh, my name is Sylvain. I'm a journalist from Switzerland, and I was interested by the Brazilian uh, story about the Amazon. I mean, it's very uh, striking testimony. Uh, one avenue of uh, investigation that is uh, open, I think, to us is to investigate the role of the big uh, commodities companies. So that means the big grain sellers, you know, people who s actually sell the soya beans to us, like in Western Europe, because uh, most of these soya beans go to cattle, they go to, uh, uh, to feed, to produce meat. Uh, do you, did you ever bump into those companies, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, traders of grain in during the investigations in the Amazon? Thanks. Okay, so um, about, about the soybean, um, uh, 11, 10 or 11 years ago, there was a deal among uh, uh, traders and uh, NGOs. Uh, it started with Greenpeace. It's a moratorium on soybeans. And so um, that that happened that that helped to control that soybean expansion in the Amazon. Uh, the biggest problem is cattle. Mo most of the forestation uh, is to raise cattle, and and it's harder to control cattle because uh, first it's easier with traders because of three or four of them. Cattle are thousands of cattle raisers, and, and the the meat packers. Uh, there's one, a big one, but uh, the, the other thing is 85% of the meat stays in Brazil. It's, it's not a major uh, commodity, uh, export commodity. Uh, but the soybean is a big problem for, the, for another biome in Brazil. It's called Cerrado, uh, which is a savanna. So the, the, the fact that they are not expanding the Amazon made them expand in the Cerrado. And it might be even too late now to... <laughs> to 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 uh, to to uh, preserve the Cerrado, it's it's an ongoing destruction that's uh, that's been happening for several years now, and people are only starting to pay attention to the Cerrado beyond. Um, my question about uh, right, the rule four about. Don't believe Bolsonaro. Um, uh, two days ago, I think, or last week, the president said that the NGOs want the people, the native people, indigenous, to live a um, state of primitive life, sort of. Would that just redirect the reporting into some sort of a political? Uh, quarrel or something. I, I mean, it, it, it seems like the official point of view that it's development, uh, again, is under development. So it, it seems that they are saying that um, environment groups or reporting or whatever is always against development, <coughs> want to develop people. Can you? show how th this is going to influence the reporting in, in particular way? Well, uh, um, I'm from Radio Arena, uh, Eritrean Radio in Paris. Yeah, well, the, the Bolsonaro, he cannot say, w when he was a congressman, he, he said more awful things because uh, it was easier to do that. So. Uh, he is still against uh, Indian reservations, the land demarcation. He's still against uh, conservation units. But he cannot say that the American cavalry is better than the Brazilian cavalry anymore. He has, he's the president now. So he's finding new arguments to attack indigenous territories. And one of them is this false dilemma between development and underdevelopment. Uh, I, I just showed the picture of the region where there were the Indians, the Panara Indians. And if you, if you think that's a development, 
I mean, I mean, of course you don't, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a very false dilemma. The, the, the mode of production that this deforestation causes is very, very unproductive. Uh, in average, uh, the cattle uh, in, in the Amazon, there's one ox, uh, 0.6 ox per hectare. It's, it's very, 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 very low production. And so it's, it's, it's a very false dilemma. Um, it, it does affect us, the f uh, he's promoting all this fake news. For instance, about the NGOs, he was saying that it was the NGOs who were setting fire in the Amazon. <laughs> it's just, just it's, it, it, I mean, it's just, I know, he said Nazi is a leftist movement. He says, uh, ye yesterday he said that Germany is trying to invade Brazil. He said that yesterday. I hope that the cables didn't translate this. <laughs> I'm very embarrassed to say that. So uh, we, we have to deal with this amazing uh, uh, things that he said all the time. But uh, we, we, the only thing we can do is report from the ground and, and say that it's very, very, very far from the truth. Thank you. More questions? And please state your name and where you're from. Hello, my name is Ifoma. I work with Voice of Nigeria. I'm from Nigeria. Nigeria is a tropical zone, it's hot. So we don't have wildfires, but we have our own share of the climate change. We have flooding, we have uh, deforestation and uh, we have communities that are being submerged because of erosion, then we are still battling with that. And from your presentation, I'm talking to you, from your presentation you say that if you don't have wildfires now, you have to get you know, towards that because it might likely happen in the future. Then I'm from a country that people don't prepare for things. We like to wait for them to come then maybe from there we start to battle. If we are still battling with all those and we've not gotten you know, to a reasonable conclusion or remarkable achievement in those areas, and you're telling me to brace up for wildfires and, and maybe in the future. So maybe I go back home and tell them, we have to brace up for this because it might likely come. I think some people will always will want it to come because the, the fire we have, if there's a fire burning, somebody has set it up because maybe they want to kill some animals. They believe that when they set the fires, it will push the animals out of wherever they are so they will be able to kill them. So I'm talking about Climate change is still an issue that people see it's a global issue, but not something that affects communities because so they feel that, okay, if so, uh, there, there is a flooding or something that something must have caused it, they don't believe that there is this issue of climate change that trigger things to happen like, unnaturally. So what message should that be that, okay, you have to brace up for this and we don't have snow, so which means that one day we'll likely have snow. Maybe I'd like that to happen, so that's it. That's a hard question <laughs> to answer, except that I would say if you have not met the leading climate scientists who study Nigeria, you should meet them and ask them what they forecast for Nigeria. Um, there's climate scientists the world over who if you look at what they were saying 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it's happening. So they, they, you know, we're not the scientists, maybe some of you are, but they have been looking at this and they have been modeling and they have been predicting. And it, it's even interesting to go back and see what were they predicting that has not happened. But we were definitely warned in our state, this is coming. Um, right? Like we... Yes. You know, I remember seven-year droughts when I was a kid, and they did not lead to the whole state feeling like it was on fire. So I would start with the climate scientists and maybe try to report what they're saying is coming in Nigeria. Yeah. Hi. 
Hi, uh, my name is uh, Suzanne Reber. I work with Scripps Washington DC Bureau. Um, I have a question for Laurent. I know that your um, investigation was only just published. Um, can you talk a little bit about <coughs> how the collaboration and, and the sort of 40 odd journalists, what has been the effect say on the journalists um, like your colleague in India is she safer now, not so safe? Like, what, what has that done for the journalists that you collaborated with, if you can talk about that? Yes, sure. Um, well, it's, um, so we just published the story on June 18, so um, it's difficult to say, and, and the goal of Forbidden Stories is not to provide physical safety, or it's, it's just to consider that we can send that strong signal that Sandhya is not alone in India, and uh, we are working with her. And, uh, and the information she is collecting, investigating, the company she is investigating, we are investigating with her. And the question you, uh, she may ask you, we want to ask you the same question. So the goal is that, but we cannot provide any kind of life insurance. That's not the goal. We are not reporter without borders. We're not thinking about... Um, uh, uh, exfiltration or things like that. We are just um, journalists. So, but we think, and s on other projects, we have also that feedback from um, journalists at risk. That uh, journalists at risk want us to work with them um, and, um, and really be noisy about that and, uh, and um, sending emails every day to people. And, <coughs> and so, uh, we were receiving, that was uh, regarding Sandhya, for instance, uh, so she was investigating one company um, in Tamil Nadu called VV Minerals. And she is uh, facing a lot of uh, um, defamatory lawsuits against, so there is a, uh, an harassment who has multiple faces on Twitter, online harassment, legal harassment, financial harassment. It's difficult for her to, uh, so she, but she's, um, she's keep investigating but uh, when we investigate with her we receive a lot of emails from the company that is that are suing her telling uh, a lot of dirty things about Sandia so f um, first that was really the confirmation uh, but we didn't have any doubt about that uh, about the kind of methods they are using to spread some dirt about some uh, reporters that are what just want to discover the truth so um, in Guatemala, uh, so we were, uh, uh, Juliette, from the uh, Juliette Garcet from The Guardian and other reporters were um, traveling in the country, investigating alongside Prensa Comunitaria, um, continuing the work of Carlos Schock. Carlos uh, is a journalist who was um, taking picture of a protest of fishermen and some fishermen have been killed. And so, and for Doing that, they criminalize Carlos and they criminalize a lot of journalists over there. And so we, um, same, we were s uh, sending that signal that uh, they are not alone. And this is not only a national issue, that's a transnational issue because that's a transnational crime. So, um, so yeah, this is a kind of feedback we have and this is a kind of uh, things we can do. Um, lovely presentation, all three of you. Very, um, of, of <laughs> course, very important issues, but also a lot of things struck my mind. Like when Martha was talking, and you, because you know Nepal also, like there are lots of these fires in the mountains and hills and the forests in Nepal, we call it Dadero. And uh, although I was always wondering why it happened, but I, I accepted that it's done because periodically these farmers and there, but when you were talking about community farms, that's what happens in Nepal now. I was wondering like uh, maybe some of the issues that you talked about might be happening on uh, different other reasons that are given. So are there w ways of any intuitions or suspicions that can be worked on to see w when fires, it happens every year, right? So what would be a kind of a lead to look into that it might be more than what it just looks like, just fires in the forest because it happens? Um, because unlike the California fires, that kind of atmosphere is not in Nepal, right? So the reason given is to clear the 
you know, like old plantation and get new one. But now I'm wondering if that's the only thing. Um, so actually, forests are meant to burn. They need to burn. And in the United States, in the West, what happened was um, there was a very big fire in 1910. And at that point, um, the government decided that it was time to start putting out fires. So when wildfires would naturally, a wildfire can break open a pine cone that has a particular type of seed within it that's only going to come open during a wildfire. So you need to have these fires, but it, so for more than 100 years in California and in the West, Montana, Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, they began extinguishing the fires. That still was kind of okay because they were pulling har they were harvesting timber. But in the 70s, Chinese timber became cheaper than American timber and the lumber industry began to shut down. So then the forests were neither allowed to burn nor was anyone taking timber out of them. And so you end up with um, very unmanaged forests and therefore wildfires can hit. I don't know the situation in Nepal and you're not, you're asking me what questions to ask. I would begin by asking who's trying to put out the fires when they burn and, um, and, and why are they trying to put them out? And when they put them out, do they go to the origin of the fire to figure out who started it? And I wanted to go back to what you were asking about using fire to flush out animals. Um, it doesn't work. They don't flush out, they burn up. Um, so, and, and fires are so unpredictable. If any were to be running in some direction, you wouldn't necessarily, it can go in all directions. So that's not a very effective way to get wildlife. Um, but after fires, I see deer and what, you know, our deer and elk just staggering around in the fire zone if they've survived or just burned up in the fire zone. So I, I hope that helps both. Hi, I'm uh, David Eads. I'm a data journalist at a very small local investigative team called the Chicago Reporter. And it's, so I'm in Chicago, and it's a city that's sort of on both ends of some of these issues from an economic perspective. It's like the companies and investors that drive these trends are based in Chicago, and the consumer markets are also in places like it. And it feels really big, and I'm kind of curious how kind of a small local shop like ours focused on, on, on urban, metro, regional type issues can sort of tackle these things and report on things and, and also be part of your ecosystem and contribute to these bigger global efforts to report on these issues. <laughs> the Chicago Reporter, for anyone in this room, is a powerful and impressive news organization that does incredible work. And my only advice would be the, the, soy, train, the soy trading and the beef trading markets, I believe, are central to Chicago's economy. And um, I think that, therefore, <laughs> when, the, you know, when we're reporting the Amazon is burning, I think that you, you call him up and say, what does Chicago have to do with this? Because this is the trading central center for these products. Um, I also would be asking what can be saved, what's on the brink that can be saved, that, that maybe a big city in America could have something to do with. I mean, it's, um, it's Brazina's fault. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, a first uh, <coughs> uh, deforestation is primarily a real estate business. So uh, the people who deforest is not the people who plant soybeans and it's not the people uh, who raise cattle most of the time. These land grabbers, they, they steal public land and they wait for, uh, until the government legalizes it. And then they sell. Uh, every government in the past decades, centuries, <coughs> they legalize uh, land grabbing. Uh, the last, last time it happened was uh, two years ago when under Michel Temer's government. And before that, during uh, Dilma's government, there was a forest code and they legalized uh, li uh, land grabbing again. And so the, uh, uh, that year it went up. So uh, it's a real state 
driven uh, business most of the time. Um, I wish w we could have <laughs> from other places, but it's uh, it's it's really complicated to do these links. People are eager to, but uh, it's it's really hard to to trace all these things. Yeah, uh, one way that uh, forest fires affect cities is through smoke, uh, and the, of course the Paradise Fire last year, the smoke from that came. To, to the Bay Area and force those of, live us, those of us living there to stay indoors for, for several days. And that, I believe also the recent Amazon fires, they sent a big black cloud over Sao Paulo for the first time. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that, do you guys report on that in Manaus and, and also in California? When I left Paradise and started heading for home five hours away, I was actually thrilled to see the blanket of smoke hitting the Silicon Valley because I thought, you guys think that this is something that happens off in the mountains, so welcome. It's, it's all of us, and you need to start getting busy doing something about this. Yeah, I, I was, I, that sounds really sicko, but I was pleased that, I mean, if the smoke could just simply hover over Washington, D.C. for a while, I feel like we would have some positive change. Um, that, that's, uh, I was talking to a colleague uh, who covers Indonesia, and he said that uh, the, the forest fires there only, and the smoke only made the news when they reached, I think, Singapore. Uh, that, that's the same thing in, in, in Brazil. Well, I live in Manaus for three years now. Every, every year there's smoke. It's depressing because it's, it's dry, it's the dry season, and you open the window, and and it can only see smoke. And, and the difference this year was that it reached Sao Paulo. Uh, maybe you heard about the, the day of fire. Uh, there was a big story about the day of fire uh, one week before it reached Sao Paulo. So some, uh, you have to understand the mentality. I, I, I put this, the, the, the picture of the this fake uh, tree, the, just to understand. They, they think it's nice to put a fallen tree made of concrete in, the, in a public park for people to sit. That's good. So you have to understand this. So people don't care so much about smoke in the Amazon. They think it's, an, it's the development coming. So a, a bunch of farmers, a group of farmers in the state of Pará, not, not very far from where I was, was the, the same road, road, they organized a day of fire. So everybody would put fire in the same day to show Bolsonaro that they were working. So th this, a local newspaper did this story. Uh, I pick it up and I waited for the day of fire. And actually, the, uh, in the day of fire, the, the, the fire occurrences uh, went up more than 300%. So it, the day of fire did happen. And I published the story, it was not a big story. Uh, the newspaper took two days to publish. No other newspaper uh, published the story. In my newspaper, every day there is a, a list, of, I think, in every newspaper of scoops. It wasn't considered a scoop or ex exclusive. Then one week later, the fire, the smoke reached São Paulo, and then my story was <laughs> all over, all over uh, the other newspapers. Uh, it, actually, the the readership was ten, one hundred times bigger than the the week before when I published it, uh, the local reporter who I talked with, uh, he got death threats. He had to leave the city where he works. He's, he's in an undisclosed location right now. So yes, it has to reach big cities to make the news in Brazil. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Safan uh, Yumpi from China. Um, in China, we have both like uh, the wildfire like in in April, there's a fire. There's a fire in southern China, which caused 30 firemen, firefighters, died uh, from a rescue. And then we also have the uh, desertification in northern Ch uh, northern China. So, which now the government is trying to conduct a forestry on the desert. So, my qu my question is first uh, the. How we can attribute the white light, white fire, to the climate changes anyway? Because we we 
we, we, what we read is that, you know, this is a caused by human behavior, like the tourists that are in these things. So there's no one says it's because of climate change and all these things. And uh, w the second question is so whether the conducting forestry on the desert works to solve the problem. Thank you. Tell me, hang on to your mic, because what do you mean the forestry in the desert? Oh, sorry, uh, just planting huge amount of trees. Oh, is planting trees yeah. solve this? Yeah. I, I, again, am going to point everybody back to the climate scientists who are studying this stuff, right? I'm curious about your 35 firefighters who died. Yeah. Um, to me, that speaks to a new type of fire that they're not familiar with fighting. Um, because firefighters are pretty savvy about fire science and about avoiding getting caught and killed. It can happen, but they're usually pretty smart to stay away from situations like that. The climate scientists, the global climate scientists, cannot say this exact fire is from climate change, just like they can't say this hurricane or this tornado is from climate change. They can say, overall, we are seeing more wildfires because of climate change, and they point to a number of factors. So I would find those scientists who study your region and say, what's going on with these firefighters? And then I would also be, like I say, uh, that's horrifying to think 35 firefighters lost their lives. Um, in California, our prison population, are they, they are let out of prison and paid $2 a day to fight our fires. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know if any prisoners elsewhere in the world have that job, but um, that, so they, they're trained and they're managed and that's like a really, a really huge fail if firefighters are getting killed by fire. That's a, that's a misunderstanding of fire science in the region. I should mention that firefighters do get bizarre diseases like brain cancers and kidney failures and such. Uh, one comment on this link to climate change. I think it's sometimes the wrong question to ask, is this fire being caused by climate change or by human beings? Because even if it's tourists, uh, it's climate change that makes it worse and uh, the wood drier. But, the, but my actual question was, um, how can we make these local stories that you wrote, for example, travel into the big news outlets everywhere, even without the smoke reaching the, the big cities? Well, um, my living in the Amazon. <laughs> I, I hope there, are, there will be more journalists living there. Uh, it's uh, in this past few months there has been there have been a lot of, of journalists going going to the Amazon, and and I've received calls like ten calls every every day in the past few weeks for people, for colleagues to have to trying to find help. But uh, I think uh, the journalists have to be on the ground. I mean, I think people have to live in the Amazon. I know it's it's not it's not a pleasant city, Manaus. It's one of the most dangerous cities in the world. It's hard to to go back and move, uh, to move around, but uh, we, we need people on the ground. I, I'm the only one from the national press there, in print press. There is no foreign journalist there. Uh, we, we, we need more funding, we need people who are actually interested in spending time there. Um, just, um, I was talking with Fabiano about that, but uh, we, we can, uh, the illegal logging in Brazil, for instance, is, uh, is of course not only a Brazilian issue. Uh, in 2013, I was in, um, investigating for in Maranhão uh, <coughs> illegal logging in Maranhão and the threats against um, the Awaguaja tribe over there, and we were tracking the the wood and who is importing that wood that have been trafficked in uh, Maranhão and Para, and we found out that the the honorary consul of Brazil in France, which was a French citizen, he was an honorary position, with, but with, uh, he was giving us an interview with a Brazilian flag <laughs> behind him, was not only the consul of Brazil, but also uh, the CEO of a company that is importing wood from, uh, from Brazil, uh, from company well known to be uh, fined every two weeks by the IBAMA uh, uh, administration over there. So. 
So, and we find some companies, so uh, French company who were buying that wood from those um, uh, very famous uh, Brazilian company, famous for being uh, fine um, frequently. So, in a way, that could be also a good collaboration to investigate the illegal logging in, in Amazon on a worldwide um, plan, maybe. Okay, thank you. I think that's a good way to wrap up. Um, we've reached our time, so thank our speakers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for.